prayer, the Psalms. This has been an incredible series for me, um, reflecting on the diversity of faith and prayer that we see through characters like David or Asaph or other people in the Psalms. And it's got me thinking this past week a lot about prayer and how I pray and, and how I think we pray uh, sometimes, how I've experienced prayer in our uh, evangelical community, our evangelical Christian community. And I feel, like, I feel like we distance God way too much from reality in many contemporary evangelical circles. Throughout the book of Psalms, we see time and time again prayers that were very specific about what they needed physically and what they received from God. It's incredible. There's dozens of these in the book of Psalms, dozens of these. I was in a bad situation, being chased by enemies or something. I called out, God, help, and hey, he did. Let's praise him together. That is like at least 30 psalms in the book of, in the book of Psalms. David, here's a few examples. David in Psalm 34. This is after he escaped being killed by an enemy king by a thread. It was a close situation. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Why, David? I sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Psalm 66, if I had cherished sin in my heart, the Lord would not have listened, but God has surely listened and heard my voice in prayer. Psalm 48, when Israel fought an alliance of enemy kings, when the kings joined forces, when they advanced together, you destroyed them like the ships of Tarshish shattered by an east wind. Psalm 92, you have exalted my horn like that of a wild ox. The horn is a symbol of salvation. Fine oils have been poured upon me. My eyes have seen the defeat of my adversaries. My ears have heard the rout of my wicked foes. Psalm 107. Some wandered in the desert wastelands, finding no way in a city where they could settle. They were hungry and thirsty, and their lives ebbed away. They were dying of thirst. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. Psalm 115. I love the Lord, for he heard my voice. He heard my cry for mercy because he turned his ear to me. I will call on him as long as I live. The cords of death entangled me. The anguish of the grave came upon me. I was almost dead. I was overcome by trouble and sorrow. Then I called on the name of the Lord. O oh Lord, save me. You, O oh Lord, delivered my soul from death, my eyes from tears, my feet from stumbling. The list could go on and on time and time again. We see the Psalms, we see in the Psalms, people pray and God answers. But so often in our prayers, we fence God in. We fence God in and make sure to leave him a back door out, just in case, just in case he doesn't answer. God, I need healing right now, or I need a financial miracle, or I need a job, or our community needs this, you name it. But you're sovereign, and maybe you won't, and if you don't, it's okay, you're still good, etc. And we go on to make sure all our theology is on record in the prayer. I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but we do this all the time. God is sovereign, it'll be all right in the end. This prayer is really about God's sovereignty, not, God, I need you to do this now, please. Why do we do that? Why are we afraid to come to God and ask him for tangible things and leave it at that? I think a big part of it is, as I've been reflecting on my own life and reflecting on my experience in the Christian community the past eight years that I've been a Christian, I think a big part of it is that we're afraid. We're afraid that he'll be silent, that he won't answer when we call on him, that he won't act when we need him. And we don't want to deal with that. We don't want to face that reality. We don't want the thought to enter our heads that he's not there or that he's not listening or that he's someone different than we thought he was. And so we build a fence around God, making sure that he knows that we know that we really do believe all these things about him, but if he doesn't do anything at all, he's still in the clear, he's still God, and our fragile emotions that we're hanging our faith on stay intact. Because when we build that fence and make sure that God clearly sees the back door out from actually answering our prayers, we don't have to deal with God's silence. We, we dealt with it ahead of time, before we even finished asking. And it's a good thing, because we didn't want to most of the time. 
We didn't want the thought to enter our mind for a second that he might not be who we believe he is, who scripture teaches to be, who two millennia of Christians and another millennium before that of our Jewish predecessors believed him to be often until they died. We're afraid he might not answer. And we want to be okay with that. We want to be okay with that. So we tell him we're okay with that. But this is the opposite. The opposite of the vibrant faith you see in the book of Psalms. The slew of verses that I read at the beginning. This is the opposite of David's faith, of Abraham's faith, Jacob's faith, Jeremiah's faith, Habakkuk's faith. They treated God like they had a real relationship with him. When they felt wronged by him, they brought it to him. When they needed help, they asked him with the utmost confidence that he really could respond tangibly to their request. Or in Habakkuk's case, when he felt like God was being completely unjust, he didn't just tell himself, you know, it'll all work out in the end. He came to God. He told him, God, I feel like your morals have been flipped on their head, and I'm going to wait for an answer from you because from where I'm standing, everything seems really, really screwed up, and I just can't let it go. They related to God like he was a person, and he related back. They counted on him to answer their prayers, and he did. Sometimes exactly what they asked for. Sometimes in unexpected ways. Sometimes in very unorthodox ways. And so you might think, so do I just go to my room and start demanding things like a three-year-old and give up on God the second he doesn't answer? Of course not. Faith involves waiting, too, doesn't it? We've seen that in the Psalms, too. We wait, watch. Listen, share in community. Your doubts, we all experience it at some point. Your pain, maybe how numb you feel, maybe how you die a little on the inside when we sing the same song three weeks in a row, or how utterly encouraged you are by that same chorus, I have no idea. That is no reflection on any selections of songs, by the way. Um, but I know that people experience this, right? We do. And, and for some reason, we feel like it's, it's not okay to not be okay. And if we're all just singing in unison around the theology that we profess, ever extolling it, then we're becoming mindless zealots in a way, not acknowledging the gray areas, not acknowledging our own struggles and how very human we all actually are, and how sometimes our theology doesn't seem to match up with reality. And there's the rub. There's the rub. We have deceived ourselves into thinking that raw humanity exists in opposition to faith. That we should simply discard ourselves, bury the thoughts that aren't sanitized, that aren't approved, and believe. And do you know how David believed? In a foxhole with people trying to murder him. He prayed very real, very non-fenced prayers. He didn't end with, but if you don't Answer, it's okay, I still believe you, okay, bye. That doesn't mean he didn't believe that. That's beside the point. He needed something from God, and he came to God and asked God for that thing. Tangibly. Do you remember Peter's sermon on Psalm 41 a few weeks ago? My tears have been my food day and night. I have, I have never prayed that communally with anyone. <laughs> He's talking to God. When he says that, my tears have been my food day and night. Raw emotion and experience aren't opposed to faith in Psalms. They're the playing field of faith. They're the medium. They're where it happens. And if we can have the courage to come to God in the same way we heard the psalmist this summer, Asaph and his doubts, David with his impossibly difficult journey to the throne, and his struggles and his need for radical deliverance. Other psalmists who felt literally dead inside emotionally and desperately needed a word from God and reassurance. They came to God in those raw moments and they weren't ashamed of their humanity. They weren't apologizing for what they were or what was happening. They said, here I am, God, fix it. Help me. And again and again, he did. But when we exercise that very real faith, 
asking God for things, expecting intervention, expecting tangible responses from God, actually believing that he's listening, daring to do that. We risk something that we don't want to think about. We risk God not answering. We risk his silence. And we risk the letdown that we feel from it. So if we are going to be bold with our prayers, like the psalmists were, what do we do when God doesn't answer? That is a question that we have to ask if we're going to be that bold. If we're going to take God seriously, what do we do if God doesn't answer? This is where we get the book of Lamentations, for instance. A heart-wrenching, five-chapter-long poem written by the prophet Jeremiah to help the Israelites process after the horrific destruction of Jerusalem. Picture burning buildings and lots of dead bodies. It was horrific. He says, this is in the beginning of the book, he says, Look, O Lord, on my affliction, for the enemy has triumphed. That's a sharp contrast to the celebratory verses that I read at the beginning. The enemy has triumphed. Another example, this is Psalm 44, a communal lament about the destruction of Jerusalem. Listen to this. You have rejected and humiliated us. They're talking to God. Imagine that. You no longer go out with our armies. You made us retreat before the enemy and our adversaries have plundered us. You gave us up to be devoured like sheep and have scattered us among the nations. My disgrace is before me all day long. My face is covered with shame at the taunts of those who reproach and revile me because of the enemy who is bent on revenge. All this happened to us though we had not forgotten you or been false to your covenant. Our hearts had not turned back, our feet had not strayed from your path, but you crushed us. For your sake we are slain. Why do you hide your face? The very real faith of the Psalms, that when God didn't answer, or when he, they felt like he was absent, they were able to come to him and acknowledge that as a community. This is the people of God acknowledging God's absence or silence and having the courage, having the courage to experience it as a community, not to whitewash it or to give God a back door out. They had prayed bold prayers of deliverance and this time God didn't answer and this is how they coped. They came to him individually or together with their very honest assessment of the situation. Sometimes these lines in the Lament Psalms, like this one, they strike us as coming from a non-faith perspective, as if they were wrong for thinking or feeling what they did, as if they needed to be corrected. They needed someone to quote Jeremiah 29, 11 to them, for I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to prosper and not to harm you. But that's born that idea is born out of our false presupposition that you can't exercise faith and be let down by God at the same time. Oh, I guess I just need to adjust my perspective while the buildings are still burning in the background. But the psalmist and the prophet said, God, please adjust your perspective. And if that sounds like an audacious thing to say, consider how many times the psalmist tell God to look at them. Hey, God, have you noticed? And instead of maintaining our cynical attitude toward their faith, we should sit at their feet and learn from them. Not only did they have the faith to pray that God actually do tangible, physical things for them, providing, protecting from a mortal threat, delivering, and a ton of other things, they also didn't balk when he didn't answer. They were committed to him through thick and thin, just as he was to them. They asked, they prayed more, they tried to understand, they listened. They didn't just walk out the moment they felt like God wasn't listening or give him a convenient back door. Jeremiah had the courage to press into God. He wrote the book of Lamentations. He had the courage to press into God when his theology was racked, as he watched his beloved city burn to the ground. We can learn from him. 
we can learn from these holy men who lived a long time ago. They were bold with their prayers, but they also had the God-given ability to suffer, still waiting for God to answer. Habakkuk is another example. He was completely scandalized by what he saw happening with the Assyrian incursion into Israel. Listen to how the book opens. That's how he opens. How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen, or cry out to you, violence? That's what he's looking at. But you do not save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? He was honest about what Scripture told him, his proper theology. This shouldn't be happening. But he didn't try to whitewash it. He didn't try to fence in God by saying, but God is sovereign. No, actually, it's your sovereignty that's the problem. And he said, I'm going to sit here, God, and I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait for you to answer because this is really, really, really messed up, and I think you're dropping the ball. It wasn't cynicism, and it wasn't disbelief. It was faith that was so all in, that was so all in, that when they felt like God wasn't answering, they came to him. See, the thing about choosing to follow God and live a righteous life is that you're actually putting all your chips on God. Paul said in 1 Corinthians of believers, he's talking to believers here, if there's no resurrection for us, if there's no resurrection for us, we are of all men to be most pitied. If it's not real, our lives as believers are a total waste, right? And when you put all your chips on the table for a lifetime, then one day God doesn't show up, you go running straight to him. You banked on him, and now there's a crisis. You've got no one else to go to. You put all your chips on God. And that's what Israel did as individuals and a community. That's what we see in the Psalms because they hadn't hedged their bets. They hadn't distributed their lives to this sort of half-following God, half-not-following God lifestyle. That sort of people is unanimously condemned throughout Scripture. And it is a fact that some of us do that. Hedge our bets. But the raw psalms and poems that we read were written by people who didn't hedge their bets. It was God or nothing. When God delivered, they celebrated his faithfulness and extolled how good and amazing he was, like the excerpts we read at the beginning. And when God let them down, when the wicked prospered, like Asaph saw in Psalm 73, he came to him. And they came together as a community when their community dealt with this and acknowledged publicly what they had experienced. Remember, all these psalms we read, we read were their version of a hymnal. They read these publicly, out loud, together. Psalm 88 is a communal lament about the destruction of Jerusalem that is so raw and honest, you will be uncomfortable reading it. And it's good. We should grow, shouldn't we, from reading Scripture. Now, in Habakkuk's case, in Habakkuk's case, his perspective did change at the end of the book. His perspective changed, and that's what he needed from God. Quite radically, actually, his perspective changed. But it wasn't just God saying, I'm sovereign, get over it, Habakkuk. Don't you remember that? It wasn't just him saying, he helped him see what was happening. He didn't reject Habakkuk's very rubber-meets-the-road faith. No, he, God embraced it, and he met him there, and he visited Habakkuk in such a real way that at the end of the book, he says, and I was trembling. I was trembling. The end of Habakkuk has a very quotable passage. It's chapter 3. Uh, I'm going to read a few verses from it. I heard, and my heart pounded. My lips quivered at the sound. This is Habakkuk talking. Decay crept into my bones, and my legs trembled. That visitation was crazy. Yet I will wait patiently for the day of calamity to come on the nation invading us. Remember, that was the problem he was talking about in the beginning of the book, and now his perspective has changed. And then here comes the quotable passage. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crops fail, and the field produces no food, though there are no sheep in the pen, no cattle in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in God my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He enables me to go on the heights. It's incredible. It's incredible that he can face that as he waits for a foreign pagan army to invade and ransack his country. But you have to realize, and here's a big part of the point that I'm getting at, you have to realize the journey that he went on, his journey of faith, Habakkuk's journey of faith, to get to that beautiful passage that I just read. 
You don't get that faith of Habakkuk without the raw honesty of chapters one and two. He went on a very intense journey with God to get to that place in chapter three. But somehow we have this impossible expectation that we place on ourselves and we place on other people that we should always be at chapter three. We should always be, though, though the fig tree does not bud, I will rejoice. We do that instead of acknowledging that the journey that we're on and that chapter one, the, the passage that I read from Habakkuk, is a valid experience. If we have the courage to come to God with the tangible faith of the prophets and the psalmists, asking for radical de deliverance and provision, we risk the letdown if he doesn't answer, the suffering. Ultimately, we risk, like Habakkuk did, the journey. We risk the journey. But the journey is worth it, even if, like Habakkuk in chapter one, we're not sure of that yet. It may take years for our perspective to change, if that's what has to happen, our understanding to change. But we can have the courage to be honest with God, to treat him like a person, to expect him to relate back to us, to have deeper faith than we have now. And it's okay if it takes a while. The best meat is aged. The best wine isn't fresh off the vine. It steeps for years. Our lives have to steep sometimes in uncomfortable realities, sometimes for a long time before we begin to understand. Sometimes we risk the journey if we're being honest in our faith. Fortunately, fortunately, in that very real, very raw journey, as David told us in Psalm 23, we have God as our shepherd who leads us through even the darkest valley. Asaph told us in Psalm 73, when we heard that sermon, that when he was utterly alone and his faith was on the brink because his theology just didn't match with his experience, when he was on the brink, even in that dark place, God came and took him by the hand. Asaph was honest with God and God met him in that honest place and renewed his faith in an incredible way. Jesus said in Acts chapter one to his disciples, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Power. There was healing, there was preaching, there was speaking in languages that people hadn't studied or hadn't learned before. There was crazy, awesome stuff happening. And these things still happen today. God heals, I have seen it. He provides money from out of nowhere, I've seen it. He fill in the blank. It happens. Can anyone here testify to this today? Anyone this morning? Amen. Have you seen God answer your prayer? Childlike faith, coming to God like a child, asking, believing he hears. He answers time and time again. Psalmists celebrate God's deliverance, his hearing their prayers, his tangible salvation, his very real deliverance. We can ask him for those things. And when we feel God's absence, when the answer isn't there, and we don't see, we can be bold in pressing into him even further. And even in that place, we can be bold in coming to God. The psalmists came to him, they mourned together, and we too can come to him when he is silent despite our most earnest petitions. And what's more, we have my dear, dear, dear brothers and sisters. We have each other. We don't have to sugarcoat our problems. We don't have to pretend we're okay. Life is extraordinarily difficult. Sometimes God doesn't pull through like we expect him to, or like we want him to, or like we asked him to. And if you read through the Bible, and if you never have, really do, you'll see a lot of, peas, a lot of people chosen specifically by God, like Jacob, like Jeremiah, like Paul, who go through some really, really crazy hard stuff. And they have times when they ask the same question. God, why haven't you answered? Why haven't you heard? What are you doing? And sometimes they didn't get answers for years. And some things remain unanswered for their lifetime. But they still fought through it. They pressed harder into God, not fencing him in, not giving him a back door. And they came together as faith communities, 
people sharing a common belief in God and what he's like. This is what we are, a faith community. They came together as this faith community and tried to make sense of what they were experiencing. They were a medium for growth, each other. They were a medium for growth. We have each other for the journey, the joys and the hardships. They had the courage to pray bold prayers and they risked God not answering and pressed harder into him when he didn't. This is not a challenge for you to become cynical. I'm not telling you to all of a sudden take some sort of inappropriate demanding tone with God but to actually learn from the prayers that we've heard preached and the prayers that we love to read and and post verses from under sunsets or mountains or something and see them in their raw honesty, their passion and how they actually took God at his word. They were in a covenant relationship with God and said, God, you've sworn yourself to me and right now I need you to be you in a miraculous way. Press into God. Don't build fences around him. Run to him. Don't qualify every prayer with a back door. Sometimes he won't answer. Sometimes we'll feel like he didn't hear. But we're not alone. We have each other to grow with, to struggle with, to be honest with, to bear all with, to be untidy with. And we have the company of some of the most amazing followers of God that ever lived. The prophets with all their pain the psalmists like David, with all their history, and even communal laments by the entire nation of Israel, crying out to God, asking, why haven't you answered yet? Welcome to the Bible. It's not cynicism. It's not disbelief. It's raw, honest, relationship, faith, stubborn. We're not leaving God. We're not giving up on you. And you know what else we're not going to do? We're not just going to hold it in and pretend everything's okay. They were stubborn in their faith. And they'd press deeper into God than a lot of us have, than I have, with that kind of faith. It wasn't cynicism. It was dependence. It was complete and total dependence. There was an illustration uh, that has stuck with me ever since I read it about lament psalms. Um, And talking about this precise point that that uh, they're not, it's not this cynical perspective of disbelief when they pray them. And uh, this author said, it's, it's like a toddler, you know, a toddler has such a dependence on his mother and they have such a close relationship, but, you know, sometimes the mother will forbid something or, or not do something that the toddler wants and, and it can make the toddler furious, right? He just gets angry and starts wailing and crying, but who does he go to for comfort in that moment? His mother, Right? It's the, it's, it's, the, it's the kind of, you can picture, you know, this little two foot tall, whatever, running up to, to his mom or her mom screaming, beating on her legs, but he needs comfort from her at the same time. And that's kind of, that's what this all in, not hedging your bets faith does when you depend on God that much. When he doesn't show up, when you really have been depending on him, we have to come to him. He's the only one we can. And we can do it together. A psalm that I picked out to read is Psalm 34 of David. And this is uh, when he, again, escaped by a thread from being killed by an enemy king. He was captured in everything. It's crazy. I will extol the Lord at all times. His praise will always be on my lips. My soul will boast in the Lord. Let the afflicted hear and rejoice. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Why, David? I sought the Lord and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him are radiant. Their faces are never covered with shame. This poor man called to the Lord and he heard him. He saved him out of all his troubles. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers him. That's a military metaphor, encamps around him. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. David dares you to try it. Try it. Taste it. Give it a go. See that God is good. Fear the Lord, you his saints. For those who fear him lack nothing. The lions may grow weak and hungry, but those who seek the Lord lack no good thing. And remember, David wasn't a stranger to trouble. Remember his life. This isn't a naive statement. It's deeply rooted in his tangible relationship with God. He cried out again and again to God in times of trouble, and God answered him. 
Come, my children, listen to me. I will teach you to fear the Lord. Whoever of you loves life and desires to see many good days, keep your tongue from evil and your lips from speaking lies. Turn from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. In other words, be righteous. Put your chips on God. Don't hedge your bets. Go all in. And why? Why would we do that? The eyes of the Lord, this is the next verse, are on the righteous. And his ears are attentive to their cry. Now here's the flip side. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil to cut off the memory of them from the earth. The righteous cry out and the Lord hears them. He delivers them from all their troubles. The Lord, and listen to where he goes here, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones, not one of them will be broken. Evil will slay the wicked. The foes of the righteous will be condemned. The Lord redeems his servants. No one will be condemned who takes refuge in him. I want the faith that David had, that the psalmist had for us as individuals. I want that faith for us as a community. What do we have to celebrate as a community? What has God done? that we've asked him to do? Where do we need to mourn as a community? Where do we feel like God was absent? What will we pray for and see God do? What do you need from God? What would you ask him for if he were right in front of you? What do we want God to do in our community and through our community? Let's bear all with him. Let's have that faith as a community, living our faith together. Loft. It has to be all of us. All in. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said this, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. He who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? It's that childlike faith in God. We can dare to have a courageous faith when we come to God in prayer and we can risk him not answering because we have each other and we have the testimony of a thousand years of believers who have dealt with it, struggled with it, struggled through it just as we will because we are all very, very human.